Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. In the early days of filming wildlife, as you'll see tonight, researchers had to capture animals in order to observe and learn from them. But that's no longer the case today. Modern technologies such as drones and satellite tracking offer new ways to study animals in their natural habitat with less intrusion free from human touch. Wild Kingdom set the gold standard for nature programming and introduced generations of young people to the wonders of the natural world. Fortunately, the successful research that began with our original series helped many animals make a comeback from the threat of extinction. And that's good news for the Wild Kingdom. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by Mutual of Omaha, people you can count on. Hello there, and welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. As we explore the Wild Kingdom and search out the many interesting things it holds for us, we're likely to chance upon some of the strange ways of the wild. Animals have many strange ways, or so it seems to us, but by careful observation, we can sometimes see unique courtship dances, unusual bathing habits, or interesting ways that animals have of saving up for a rainy day. There are those that we just can't explain. And then there are some that are even difficult to interpret. For example, is this a gesture of friendship or of animosity? This is a Celebes ape from the Celebes Islands, now a part of Indonesia. And this gesture of lip smacking is a gesture of friendship. It's one that says, hi, pal, come on over. Let's get together and have some fun. They say this to their friends if they're people or if they're other monkeys. And these are most interesting and I think very friendly monkeys. Here comes Jim with another friendly monkey, Morgan, a stump-tailed macaque from the Orient who has a very strange uh, habit that is characteristic of all macaques, including Blackie here. Jim, set that food tray up there on top and there you go, show them what we mean. Well, we're seeing an example of very quick storage and hoarding of food. Uh, these monkeys do this because they're family animals, and when they get near a food tree, they want to be sure they get everything that they possibly can. Now that pouch is like a big sack on either side of the jaw, and he crams it full, and in a while you'll see that he not only, when he finishes cramming it, then he goes ahead and eats all he can too. Mm -hmm. But this is good because later on he can go off into a tree and take his hand and push those pieces of uh, food back into his jaws and eat them, and he can eat all day this way in safety. It's very handy. That is a wonderful thing. Of course, the, one of the odd things is that all monkeys don't have those cheek pouches. I think that's odd, too. Just the uh, uh, old world monkeys have them. Yeah, and not all animals have pouches, either. That's right. And um, mostly the animals that have those cheek pouches are monkeys and rodents. And of the rodents, mostly those that have cheek pouches are those that have to eat on the run or else those that store their food underground. Hamsters are good examples of rodents with well-developed cheek pouches, which they fill with food similar to the way the monkeys do, and then carry that food into their underground burrows. Hamsters gather their food from long distances away from their own burrows and stuff uh, all kinds of different seeds, grasses, grains, fruits, vegetables in their pouches, filling them up and then uh, taking them full down into their burrows and uh, placing the food in the storage chambers. Well, those cheek pouches are a little bit longer than they are on a monkey, too, and more full, aren't they? Yeah, and in addition, they carry other things like uh, nesting materials, grasses, grains, strings, and things like this. And you know, Jim, 
The seeds and grains that they store underground are actually fit for human consumption and are dug up and eaten by the people of Europe and Asia during years of famine. Well, that might be a good thing to know. He must have his pouches full because I, he's starting to go back in his cage and dump them out now. There are many ways in which animals hoard or store their food. Our nature photographer and my good friend Warren Garst had the good fortune to photograph what I think are very rare examples of hoarding behavior seldom seen. Here's a small rodent called a pika who lives in the high mountainous areas of western North America. He also lives in Asia and Europe. The American pika is known as the coney. He's related to the rabbit and the hare. What makes him so interesting to us is that here is one of the few animals that actually seems to harvest a crop. It's true he doesn't plant his own crops like we do, but as we watch him at work collecting grasses and roots and storing them away for use in the winter, we realize that this animal has developed his own special way of withstanding the rigors of climate. As any good farmer will tell you, grass must be dried before it can be stored. So this pika first stores his harvest in haystacks in the open where it will dry. He will collect enough roots, leaves, and stems to fill his underground storehouse. From these materials will come a nice warm nest and enough food to last him throughout the long, cold winter. And you really can't blame him if once in a while he pauses to sample some of the harvest. The instinct to hoard nesting materials and food is very common among small rodents. This little arctic ground squirrel also has a problem. Instinct, perhaps triggered by the changing length of the days, has told him that he'd better start preparing for winter. In the northern areas where he lives, the ground will be completely covered with snow from three to six months of the year. During this time, he will have no food except that which he's collected and stored. And there will be no warmth except that which he can preserve in his own body by building a snug grass nest in the burrow. Yes, this little arctic ground squirrel has a problem. His problem is survival, and each year, by instinct and hard work, he solves it. In open country from Alaska through Canada, the United States, and Central America, you'll find this wily predator. He, of course, is the coyote, and he lives on an all-meat diet, part of which is rabbit. He seems to have a problem of overabundance at the moment. Let's see how he solves it. We're watching a normal canine behavior. I'm sure you've seen a dog bury a bone, but I doubt if you've ever seen a coyote hoard his food. Well, I agree that those are some examples of hoarding behavior that are rarely seen, but for my money, I think old Morgan here has got the best system. <laughs> well, perhaps you're right, Jim. Hey, let me take Morgan for a minute, Jim, just to show you another strange way of the wild. This is a technique known as grooming, where you look through the hair of the monkey, mimicking their action, because they do it to each other all the time, as a social activity. And as you go through the hair here, you're not necessarily looking for fleas, but any particle of dirt. And this is the way to make friends with monkeys. I've made many good monkey friends in our monkey house by simply offering to groom them. You see how nicely relaxed they get when you offer to do that? The ways in which some animals bathe are indeed strange. You remember the story about the boy that went to the circus manager and asked for a job, his first job, and said he wanted a really big one, so the manager put him to work washing the elephants? Well, it is a big job. And in the wilds of Africa, elephants have solved this bathing problem in their own way. Many animals take a dust bath and will also at another time bathe in water. The dust bath will help to get rid of ticks and insects which are so irritating to their sensitive skin. The elephant's trunk serves many purposes and with it he has a food supply that's not available to other browsing animals. His real problem is quantity and he has to do things in a big way. This is truly a spectacular sight one of those rare moments in nature which we're sometimes privileged to see. Dust bathing in the smaller animals is just as important as it is with the larger. 
But in the smaller ones, it's important for the care of their fur or their feathers. One of the finest and softest furs in the world is found on the chinchilla. And this little rodent loves nothing better than a dust bath in fine, clean dust. We give them these old coffee cans to get into because they like to get in something like a burrow. They feel more comfortable when the tips of hair, their hair is touching the uh, cylinder itself. But they like nothing better than a dust bath in soft dust. I'll put one in. Just about sound asleep, I think. Yeah. They get a uh, pan of soft dust every afternoon here in the zoo. And they're a little curious about it. First, Very. they have to sniff it and make sure that everything's all right. Very suspicious about this. Yeah. But eventually, they hop in. And once they do, then they start rolling <laughs> over and over. It looks fun. Isn't that a great, uh, interesting thing? Now, of course, they don't have parasites here in the zoo. But uh, they dust bathe just the same. I think it's the, to take the oil off of their fine fur. Yeah, once they get started, there's lots of activity with this dust bath. Chinchillas bathe in something dry. It's a little more unusual for an animal to dry on something that's wet. Otters do this. Jim has been making extensive observation on, on a pair of otters in northern Wisconsin. Jim, when did your observation start? Well, it started in the spring when the otters were babies. Like most mammals, otters are usually born in the spring, generally as twins, like these two kittens that I found along a spring-fed stream in northern Wisconsin. In order to observe their natural behavior, I worked with my camera in a blind some distance away. Otters are beautifully streamlined for swimming with a flat head, small ears, a flexible body, webbed feet, and a powerful tail that's used as a rudder. From the day they first open their eyes, they're almost constantly on the go, learning how to get along in the world. This one may find that mud isn't a very satisfying food, but he'll soon develop into one of the wild kingdom's most expert fishermen. Rivers and streams are main highways through the woods. And suddenly along came two baby foxes. Before I knew it, I was witnessing one of the rarest meetings in the wild kingdom, the chance meeting of two young animals of a different kind. Neither animal showed any great concern over the presence of the other at first. They got along all right until the foxes discovered the otter's den. Then the otters decided that they better have a look into this. For a while, it looked like there was going to be a big argument. But instead, it turned out just to be a fast exit. Those young foxes didn't know how lucky they were. They left just in time because a mother otter will defend her young at all costs. After studying the otter's habits during their first weeks of life, I returned again in the winter. Like human children, young otters like to play, and they welcome the first snowfall as an invitation to go coasting. Now they find that their streamlined bodies, so well adapted for swimming, are equally well adapted for tobogganing.
Even though sliding in the snow is great fun, they are most at home in the water, where their thick, oily fur coats keep them warm, even in ice-cold water like this. After the swim comes their strange way of the wild. They dry themselves on something wet, snow. By rubbing their fur on the blanket of snow, the water is absorbed. These otters like the snow. They like the feel of it and the taste of it. There's no doubt that in the wintertime, otters have fun. Jim, it was a wonderful experience, and I don't think I've ever seen an animal that enjoyed life more than an otter. We have a wonderful little otter right here in the zoo. About as fun-loving and carefree as any animal I've ever known. Jim, hand me one of those little crayfish here, and I'll see if he's interested in that. Hi, little otter. Hey, little otter. Want to play with the crayfish? <laughs> Look how he goes around there, on his back, rolling around. <laughs> Come over here, play with this one. There. Isn't that fun? Look at there. Want to play with the ball instead? Here. Here's a little red and white ball. Here we go. Come on. I've never seen anyone have more fun than an otter. If I were to choose the strangest of the ways of the wild, it would just have to be a chameleon lizard because everything about them is strange. They have a tongue that's literally longer than their own body. And with this, they grab insects, like the cricket that I'm putting on this branch. Well, he's zeroing in on that already. Yeah, he's starting towards it, isn't he? Now watch, Jim. Look, he's getting ready. Wacko! <laughs> yeah, you see how fast that action was? That was a real bullseye. Yeah, it was so fast. Let me do it again. Yeah, I could hardly see at that time. He certainly has an independent action with his eyes. Yes, they move independently. He looks forward with one eye and back over his shoulder with the other one at the same time. And he rotates them all over the whole clock. But notice what he's doing, Jim, right now. Yeah, he's got them both lined up right on the cricket now. That's right. He's getting depth perception by using both eyes. Now watch closely. Here he goes. Bang! That guy never misses. He never <laughs> does. He's a slow-moving lizard. But his tongue action is just remarkable because of the speed. Oh, he's doing another thing now, too, which I think is pretty strange. They're weaving back and forth, huh? Yeah. yeah. This is a kind of a dance of some sort. I think it's territorial. I think what he's saying is to other chameleons, and maybe to us, too, look out, fellas, this is my home. This is where I live. Uh, stay away. He's letting us know that by his actual movements. Mm -hmm. Dancing and prancing isn't so unusual in the animal world. And primitive man has often patterned his own dances after those in nature, particularly birds. Let's take a trip now into the wild kingdom of one of those birds, onto an open prairie, where we're going to witness one of the strange and beautiful rituals called the mating dance. It's dawn, and the sun is just coming up over a cold horizon. The time is early spring, and we're in the prairie country of the northern United States. It's in country like this that the prairie chickens congregate in areas called booming grounds. Here the male birds rush about, stamping their feet, booming, strutting, and competing with each other for the attention of the females. To make themselves look more impressive and to attract the attention of the hens, they inflate the balloon-like orange pouches on either side of the neck and call with a hollow booming sound. As if this weren't impressive enough, they also have inflatable patches above their eyes and feathered horns which they can raise or lower at will. 
This courtship display is one of the most beautiful in the wild kingdom. Equally spectacular is the courtship display of the sage grouse, a much larger bird than the prairie chicken with tremendous inflatable pouches. His aim is to collect as many hens as possible and to scare away all other males. Perhaps here we see an example of strange behavior which will help perpetuate only the strongest members of the species. In the wild kingdom, this is the formula for survival. If you think the dancing and strutting of those birds was strange, I'd like to have you meet a member of the monkey family that has one of the wildest and strangest dances you've ever seen. He's a relative of little Susie here. Heine the first, right out here in the monkey house. Come on, Susie. Let's go. Let's go. You got this. Jim, do you think she'll ever learn how to do a stomp dance? Oh, I don't know. She's not acting like it now, but this is something that's characteristic of all chimps. She may be the best of all someday. Well, I wonder if she is. I hope she will, because she has a, a very interesting face and a fine uh, physique. Maybe she, too, will turn out to be a great little old stomp dancer. There are many strange ways of the wild. There are so many mysteries in nature that the more we learn about them, the more new mysteries we discover. It's a never-ending search when you seek an understanding of the strange ways of the wild kingdom. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom.